So that's where Tom Whiteley left off. And then once you've defined it, then you'll expand the whole back of the <coughs> And that's Jason Cooper. He's, as they're digging, he's checking out all the rock, to make sure they haven't missed something, because Tom had done a study of certain layers, but hadn't thoroughly studied some of the upper layers. And so they wanted to make sure they weren't throwing something away on the pile. And they did, they did throw something away, and I'll get to that eventually here. But uh, once the bulldozer is done, then you gotta go and clean out all the stuff that's still down the dirt and the debris. Then, it, then eventually you get into collecting. And when you start, you know, it's again fairly clean in the hole, but then after it rains, you get a little seepage, and eventually it starts to get muddy. You can see the, the mud down there. And, uh, but the layers here come up to nice sheets. You can get pretty big sheets. And you can see the uh, nice vertical cuts in the rock. And this is, uh, I've seen that in several other places too, where you get these nice seams which really makes it easier to get the rock up. You drive the wedges in, you get a nice big chunk, and you peel it up. But you can see the water start to creep in on the left. And this picture is not very good to focus, but there's a lot more water. So again, we're dealing with the water. So, And this one, because it's, it's basically down in the pit, we couldn't just drain the water out. We had to use a water pump to get the water out. And then it fills back in, you pump it. So there we are, peeling over a pretty good sized slab. And I feel, you know, we feel proud about peeling up the slab that big, but Jason Cooper, he is so strong, he moved that rock by himself afterwards. And then you end up with a bunch of these rocks, and we stand them up vertically because there are trilobites on the surface, so we wash down the surface of everything that's dug up. Then some of it, the shale is really sticking to the layer hard, you see it weather a little bit. And then you scrub it again. And uh, then trilobites do appear. And a lot of the slabs end up coming out. This is a picture actually from Tom Whiteley's basement of some of the slabs that he had from his dig. This is the bottom layer. Because we were actually collecting through uh, probably five feet of the layer. But the, the bottom layer has got a lot of the uh, Sororis trilobites in it. I'll show you some pictures of that. Then again, this rock is very hard, and we have to cut it down to get it home, so I don't have the three-sequence picture of Jake disappearing in the cloud of dust, but um, we do a lot of cutting. So up there, you do find flexicality. It's a different species than around here. But they are very nice tall lights. But this rock is so hard, um, it takes about 10 hours to prep flex it. And in the middle of the picture is a unprepped Sararis, but there's one that's prepped. And that's the most common trilobite up there is a Sararis, which around here is really, really hard to come by. But it's pretty common up there. And then, of course, I steal this. And you can see from the, uh, the six-inch ruler there how big these things are and how inflated they are. Really three-dimensional trilobites. So that's probably a seven inch trail bike. There's a side of another one. This is what they started to see where these trail bites showing up in a layer where ice teal is one supposed to be based on previous studies that were done by Tom and by Walcott. So that sent Jake and Jason scrambling to the hill to look at every rock they'd already thrown up on the pile. <laughs> they ended up finding every piece of the pocket. And this is the pocket. It's three feet by eight feet. And it's just full of ice steels. And that is now currently sitting in Oklahoma, being prepped by a guy named Bob Carroll. It's going to take him two or three years. Probably. This is another piece they were working on that you can see five ice steels sticking out there. There it says one, two, three, four, and one over here, five. And there's also a rolled up one right there. There's another trail right here. And you can see a couple of sororis sticking out here. So probably what was written, so this pocket has big isotelos, lots of them. So it's probably an egg laying event. They were laying their eggs, 
and all these other trilobites came in to feast on the eggs that were being mm. dumped. So they occur in these egg-laying pockets, and it would be very easy for Walcott and Tom Riley and their digs if they didn't hit a pocket, they wouldn't have seen them. But Jake and Jason opened up a big enough hole to actually hit one of these pockets. I think now they've hit three big osteolus pockets. Here's one that's prepped out. This one is five and a half, six inches. There's another one. I don't have a scale on that one. But the beautiful three-dimensional preservation. And then there's a whole variety of other trilobites you get from there. Not only the Aesteolus and the Flexicalamine and the Sororus, but you also get the Anastas, Thaliops, Hypothecronotus. Um, there's a lichen there. Um, Metotinella, and then this one up in the upper right-hand corner with the big bulbous nose, um, Spherocorphy, which is kind of the trilobite Jake and Jason decided to adopt as their you know, the, uh, index fossil for the Walcott Ross. So it's got this big bulbous cephalon. And now the picture made, makes it look really big. That trilobite is only half inch long. <laughs> they don't get to be very big, but they're beautiful specimens. Okay, so many species of trilobites, Sororus is the most common, Isotelus is fairly prevalent, there's a lot of small ones, and Fluxicalamine occasionally, everything else is much rarer. And then a lot of other fauna also. So just uh, some special thanks to a lot of the people that I've collected with that have you know, been very important to my collecting hobby, and um, quite a few people. Uh, notice that there's a lot of cougars on there. Dan, Jason, Chris, Ben. It's a family affair. And then just close, just some collecting recommendations. Uh, use surface collecting as a way to find out where the fossils are. And then dig to get the high quality and quantity of the material. And you got to learn how to manage water. There's always water Thanks. These are some of Don's collections. Well, I have a, uh, what's called a Chicago Dynamic, which is a miniature air hammer. And they're really fine points, the needles point. And so, in this case, I would have gouged along here to work around to expose the specimen. And then to, to finish them off with a uh, miniature sandblaster. Yeah, how, do you, how do you, the sandblaster, how do you clean something like that without the, the, the coloration? Well, it's slow and under magnification. <laughs> what percent, when you say there's something in there, what percentage turns out to be something good in there? What percentage turns out to be, I say a dry, just a dry guy. I mean, can you, can you have a pretty good idea? Huh? Well, I you mean, when I get a rock? Yeah, when you get a rock. Yeah, come on. I, well, well um, this is worth investigating. How much is How much is a dry lead? How much is Well, I would say uh, out here that the child bites break pretty clean, usually. Mm -hmm. So I'd say, you know, um, at least half of what you find, mm -hmm. you know what you got right away at this site. Because so, yeah, okay. the, the rock is soft enough that mm -hmm. it'll, it'll break cleanly over the truck. might break through there, and mm -hmm. those are hard to save. Right. Other places like the uh, Walcott Rust place, it's not until you start cleaning, you find out if there's more there than, you know, it could just be a body segment. Right. And when, do you, when do you quit? Well, that's why you kind of go in and probe and see, okay, can I find the tip of the nose? Can I find the tip of the tail? So it should be here. And say, okay, look like there, yeah, the spacing looks right. So yeah. Now it's well, this was what I found, but when I flipped the rock over, there was one there, so I just cut it to stand it up vertically so I could see all four specimens. Now, these two rocks in this box, those two broke. When I split the rock, there was the bug. Wow. 
Daddy, how are they shaking? That doesn't happen very often. But, uh, Daddy, do you know, I like the two and that's one. Yeah, they're all pretty neat with me. <laughs> These people discard the uh, um, flexies and matrix because they can't get them out. And they, uh, um, they're, particularly if the rock is hard, they don't have um, air abrasive cool. Yeah. Because there's people always looking for unprepped material. <laughs> so if we think there's something in there, we shouldn't just say, yeah, I'll never get it out. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. There was one trollback that was found uh, by Bruce Gibson a long time ago, like 30 years ago. And this rock was like concrete. And he decided there's no way to clean this thing, so he sold it really cheap in a, you know, a box of other stuff on the show. Somebody took that out of that box. They prepped it out. 